continue on with our subject, which we have been covering uh, last week in this, about green light and the intelligence of green light. What we're into, for those of you who may not have been here before, uh, or within the last couple of weeks, is a paper that was written by Dr. Jeremy D Narby of Stanford University. He's an anthropologist who has reached the point of proving that plants communicate with human beings in their own language. Um, now, that would sound strange. If it came from some New Age journal, I would say, OK. But this isn't. This is from one of the world's leading anthropologists and physicists. It's very, very interesting. Because what it means is if his ideas are correct, we then can prove how meditation actually works and how something coming from the outside enters into the human brain, if you would, and communicates intelligently. Or in other words, how God made all of this stuff occur. It's very, very fascinating. Would you do me a favor and take that off of that chair? Yeah, yeah it's great. Um, but before we continue with that, I wanted to share with you something that I gave you a moment ago, which is stuff number 116. This is one of those things that I'm providing so that, you know, we can keep our eye on this and be aware that something is going on here. I, I, I go into shock when I, you know, sometimes I see the people up there have no idea these things are happening. Scientists are, are, are bulging with stuff every day, and yet people still file into churches and ignore the reality of what is coming down upon them and what is looking down upon them. We're, uh, we're anticipating, of course, the arrival around the year 2000 or 2002, the light from the center eye of supernova, 1987A, which, of course, the center eye, as you've seen over and over again, is a green eye. And if you haven't seen it, and you know, this is a picture from National Geographic. That center eye, which is green, is on fire. Uh, and according to Hubble and the scientists from the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, the light from that should touch the Earth around the year 2000 or 2002. So in other words, and, and that's up to, for grabs, it could be tomorrow afternoon for all we know. And, and what we're talking about light, we're not talking about light as this light, we're talking about magnetism, power. The power of the center eye. It could be the power of God's eye touching down on the earth. And, uh, you know, the, it's, it's amazing to me that so few people realize this is happening. But indeed it is. But now we've got something else that I just shared with you in stuff page 116. A star named Eta Carinae that has dimmed for decades suddenly has lit up again and is tripling its energy mostly in invisible light. Once again, the documentation you have is from CNN. I mean, it's scientific document documentation. There is nothing in any of this documentation I've given you that's either New Age or, uh, you know, religious or anything like that. It, it is scientific. What puzzles astronomers, according to this document, and you can read it, is that Eta Carina was not supposed to do what it's doing. Occasionally, it says something happens in astronomy that is so bewildering that it makes astronomers nervous. And it says here from Dr. Uh, or, or Chris Davidson of the University of Minnesota astrophysicist, what a way for a, a, a scientist to put it. This is weird. <laughs> we don't understand. Now, I'm going to page two. I have page two. I didn't give you page two. I just want you to have that so you know that this is happening. And if you want to pick up page two, you can go on the CNN website and you can download this stuff. But I'm going to page two because there's, there's some things on page two that are significant. Here is something that the scientists say is weird, tripling its energy in invisible light. And this is what it says on page two. The star, about 7,500 light years from Earth, is among the most massive and energetic in the known universe. The energy it emits, most of it invisible radiation, is up to five times more powerful than the sun. This thing, which nobody understands, is 
getting brighter and brighter and brighter, and something is going to happen. And, you know, everybody walks around as business as usual. There's no threat or anything like that. There's a question of that the planets and, and the heavens are aligning themselves and changing. And this is one of them. Okay? Now listen to this, what it says. Eta Carina was a routine part of the sky in the southern hemisphere until the 1840s when it was observed to erupt with a massive outflow of energy. For odd watchers on Earth, it, it was as if a light bulb had been turned on in heaven. Suddenly turned on. Suddenly this light came on that wasn't there before. It became very bright for 20 years, and its brilliance matched a supernova. Then it became dimmer and dimmer and dimmer until suddenly it disappeared. Astronomers learned that what was happening up there was that this super immense cloud of dust started to block the light and, and, and blocked it out. But they thought, well, you know, when the dust clears, they expected it to start to slowly brighten until sometime in the next century it would, you know. But Eta Carina surprised the experts. Over a matter of months, the star was seen spewing out vast amounts of energy in all bands of the electromagnetic spectrum. Astronomers had not expected such an energy burst for many decades, and it was expected that the star would first emit cooler radiation, such as a warning of coming violence, but it didn't happen. Now, this is what I want you to listen to. And, and just, just, let's just consider this. There are about 6,000 stars in the sky visible to the naked eye, and the scientists in this project say we understand them all with the sole exception of Eta Carina. There is no theoretical explanation for this. Theorists believe it may create a hypernova, a stellar explosion many times more powerful than a supernova. It could then start spewing gamma radiation in short waves that might equal the entire energy of the sun, and such bursts might even be hazardous at 7,500 light years, the distance to the Earth. So the Sky King that Nostradamus predicted. Now, people, there's, they've got a Nostradamus website, and everybody's going nuts because Nostradamus said in July 1999 the Sky King would return. I have provided to the website, and I provided to you my own interpretation of that. And, you know, unfortunately, many people are going to be very, very disappointed in July and they're going to discredit Nostradamus that, oh, well, this guy didn't know what he was talking about. Well, he did know what he was talking about. Because when he used the word July, well, first of all, when he talked about 1999, he was an astrologer, obviously, and understood the age of Aquarius. And then he used the word July because July is the seventh month. And he was talking about the Sky King would return. So everybody, you know, that doesn't understand this, and a lot of people in the New Age, they do the same thing that people in fundamentalism do. They take these things literally. What he was talking about was that the Sky King, which is Uranus. If you look up the word Uranus in, in, in uh, the um, dictionary, it is the, called the sky god or the sky king. And Uranus is the seventh planet out from the sun. And the appearance of Uranus in 1999, which is right on the button, would cause this upheaval. So this is what he's talking about. He's not talking about something's going to happen in July. You know, what happens in July is the all-star game and you go on vacation and nothing's going to change. But th this here definitely is something that he was predicting. And therefore, obviously, his prediction is right on the money. Right on the money. And of course, not only the Sky King is the seventh planet out, which is Uranus, but in addition to that, uh, the seventh chakra, which brings then the kingdom or whatever in the same way inside in the body. So they say something is happening now with this Eta Carina. And, and this could cause something down the road which could affect the Earth. But what I say is between this that they've discovered and Supernova 1987, now you don't have to wait for anything down the road. This is happening now. The electromagnetism flow down from Eta Carina, the electromagnetism flowing down from Supernova 1987A are having an effect and will continue to have a greater, greater, and greater effect on the Earth and the changes on the Earth. The word Eta, incidentally, the word Eta, 
Greek word means seven. All right? And the word carina means it's the keel of a ship, the front of a ship, the breastbone of a bird, the front part, the, you know, the keel. So then we'd say, is this the seventh ship destined to bring the cargo of cosmic change? So we want to look at these things very carefully. And you, you want to have that you know, as part of the material so that you know. All I want you to know is this stuff is going on. I don't want you know, the people up there know the church is on Sunday. But other than that, they know nothing. I want you to know what's actually happening. This is God's universe. And it's time for this great change. And as Nostradamus said, July 1999, the Sky King appears. Well, you know that the Sky King is the seventh which is July, the seventh Uranus is now making its power felt. And the power of Uranus is causing this tremendous upheaval in, in the positioning of planets. We've seen supernova 1987A. You've seen the movement of Pluto and Chiron. All of these things are happening. And I mean, you know, I don't know how you can ignore them or how people can ignore these any more than you could if somebody was changing things in the second floor of your house or in the basement, you'd want to know. Well, these are changes in your house. You know, a lot of people think when they look in the universe, they look up at the stars. Well, you're not. Don't forget, you're on the planet Earth. And it's all down here, too, as well as up there. You're in the middle of all of this. So, you know, it, it, it's a very interesting time, and it's a very interesting thing for you to pay attention to and be aware that something big is happening. What did the astronomer say? in their very professional way, in a time of total confusion and chaos on the Earth, in a time of confusion and chaos in the universe, caused by the planet of confusion and chaos, Uranus, which turns everything upside down. What was his statement? Chris Davidson, University of Minnesota, astrophysicist, this is weird. We don't understand it. And that's all you can say when you get into things like this. Okay. Now, last week, we considered one of the most interesting concepts ever. And this is on a paper that has just been released. It was released in May by Dr. Jeremy Narby, who's an anthropologist from Stanford University. And what he did, and what he's doing, is coming to the conclusion in the Amazon jungle, imagine this, coming to the conclusion in the Amazon jungle that the people of the jungle had proved an ability to use plants for healing. Now, this is interesting to me because of the material that I gave you, um, which was page 114, in which NASA titled the, the, their paper, The Green Party, saying that light from above touching the green of the earth for chlorophyll in plants, touching the hema, which is the same thing in human beings, causes photosystem one, which is the biggest power booster on the planet. Green light. That's why I wanted you to have a green light. So now here, Dr. Norby is suddenly showing us in a, in a paper released just this month in May that there is something strange here because people in the center of the middle of the jungle who have no scientific background, no way of understanding, have understood how to combine the molecular properties of different plants to cause healing, etc. The proof that he got that they were able to do this was what came from the very fact that pharmaceutical companies themselves we're actually going to these jungle places and learning how these people in the middle of the jungle were able to do this. I mean, how, you know, th this was the thing. When Dr. Narby went into the center, was in the jungle, he was sitting around in this fire camp and he was talking to a shaman who was the medicine man there. And he said, how are you able to understand the molecular properties of these things so that you can combine them and heal people. And the shaman said, we ingest the plant. It gives us a hallucination, and it tells us what to do. And so, oh, wait, it's crazy. But do you know what? He found out it was true. He, 
here you have pharmaceutical companies from all over the world coming to these jungles to find out how these people, look what they do. They take this hallucinogen, well, however you spell it, well, we just, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> well, they take this hallucinogen, this is a plant, okay, and they boil it. Then they ingest, now if you were to take the hallucinogen, the plant, and you boil it, and you take it into your body, it wouldn't do anything. It wouldn't do a thing. What these people, however, did in the jungle, found another plant out of the 60 billions of plants. This plant, what happens here is when you would take this hallucinogen, there is an enzyme in the stomach that would destroy the hallucinogen so it couldn't touch the brain. Well, what they found out was another plant that countered the enzyme in the stomach, so it let the hallucinogen go. And what he said was, how in God's name were you able to find this plant that did this out of 60 billion plants? And they said, the plant told us. <laughs> the plant told you. So, of course, Dr. Narby is a very presti prestigious scientist, and he's with all the scientific people out at Stanford and all over the world. And, 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 and they did introduce him, and he said, Dr. Narby, aren't you the guy that the, the, you know, the, the plants told you what to do, and so forth. So it's very good. The gist of this study is that the people of the Amazon told Dr. Narby that their knowledge of the molecular structure of plants and abilities to heal came from the plants themselves through their induced hallucinations. How could this possibly be? But you know where Narby was coming from, well, what became so interesting to me is I have, and we've been working on the same thing here. What Dr. Narby was doing was saying, these people have discovered something. There's no doubt that they know what they're doing. They don't just know, well, this plant, now, they know the molecular structure of these plants. They know how you have to interact one plant with another to get the desired effect for healing something. The shaman said, I, I can heal just about any disease, but but the point is, what Narby's saying is, how do they know that? And, and you can, you know, we can laugh at this and say, well, the plant told me, but how would they know how to do that? How could they possibly know? But then I say the same thing. How does Democrates know to write about the movement of the electrons inside of an atom 3,000 years ago? How did Zeno of ancient Greece know to talk about quantum physics? How, you know, how did Pythagoras know all about, you know, the, the structures of the universe and the sounds of the planets? And I mean, who told these people this stuff? The people took a plant. If they boiled and drank it, it wouldn't do anything because an enzyme in the stomach would destroy the hallucinogen. It would destroy the molecular part that made a hallucinogen. But somehow they found another plant out of millions of plants that countered the enzyme, so the hallucinogen went to the head. And they said that the plants told them which one to take. But everyone knows that plants don't talk. I mean, that, that's silly, because if you have a plant, and it's in the jungle, and it's talking jungle language, I don't even know what language they talk. And if you bring it to Fork and River, what's it going to talk, English? <laughs> so it's silly. But let me give you an idea of what this all boils down to, which is so interesting. You know what he found out? And Albert will confirm this. The DNA in the plant is exactly the same as the DNA in us. And the DNA coming from the plant was entering in and communicating with the DNA in us and decoding the encrypted message. Well, you know what's so interesting is now I understand how that light coming in through meditation through the pineal gland touches the green of the hema, stimulates an external DNA that communicates with the internal DNA. The angle of light photon messenger starts to explain to us and enlighten us. I understand now. So Narby had to admit. Let me just, yeah. just explain photon and messenger. Just oh, well, sure. Um, a photon is an angle of light. 
Albert Einstein gave us that. But the angle, the light comes down from the universe, touches the Earth on an angle. It's called a photon. If you look up the word in a dictionary or scientific journal, a photon is a messenger particle. So we have an angle of light messenger. And of course, you look in the Bible, and it says an angel of light is a messenger. Well, of course, but now we know what it is. It's a photon. I like the word photon better than angel anyhow. So that's basically what it is. But this is the interesting part. What we're going to find out, what Dr. Narby found out, was DNA emits a photon. In other words, your body sends out photon. How do I know this? I am going by this anthropologist scientists of the University of Stanford University in California. They measured it. The light of a candle is the light emitted by the human body. And what did Jesus say in the Bible? No one puts their candle under a bushel. Let your candle shine. Let photon shine. Send it out. When I've told you in meditation so many times, send the light to somebody, I can prove it now. I can prove it. We have scientific proof. And Narby, uh, what he had to admit was... Uh, Something was screwy here because when he first got involved in this, he said, you know, these people are somehow gaining access in their visions to verifiable information about the molecular structure of plants for healing. Somebody was giving them this. But, I mean, the guy didn't even have any clothes on. I mean, he's sitting around a fire. Well, how does he, what does he know? How does he know? And we're sending pharmaceutical people, scientists, to the jungle to find out what are we supposed to mix with that? And, you know, can you imagine such a thing? So now Narby had to rationalize it. Was this information coming from inside of the brain? That would be the scientific point. Or was it coming from the outside world, from the plants, as the shaman said? So when he discovered that, began him to allow to close in on the mystery, he said, what I'm finding is there is a similarity between the molecular profiles of the hallucinogen in the plants and the chemical in the brain called serotonin. And he said, it seems to me that serotonin and this plant stuff are the same keys to fit into the lock inside of the human brain. So he took the next step as Carl Jung took. You know, Carl Jung, this great psychoanalyst, fill me up. And he took one. And he saw luminous snakes and serpents. Everybody sees snakes and serpents. And everybody sees snakes and serpents because the hallucinogen was conveying the twisted, coiled, entwined serpent called DNA. And after he took it, Dr. Narby said, I am finding it increasingly easy to suspend disbelief and consider the view of the jungle people as potentially correct. Think. The green light, as NASA put it, the green party, as you have on page four. NASA just put out the green party statement a couple of weeks ago, followed just right after that by Dr. Narby's paper. Entering into the human brain, bringing with it a coded message that cosmically, scientifically, and molecularly is correct. And so Narby said then, it no longer seemed unreasonable to me to consider that the information about the molecular content of the plants was coming from the plants themselves. Though I failed to see how this could possibly be, he said, nonetheless. So consider yourself. You're meditating. Is this the result, if there is such a thing, going to be from the outside? I mean, if, if you're meditating and you're omen or you're watching yourself or you're sitting there in the dark in the Kataro's plan or what the heck is going on? Is something coming in with information? Or is it going to trigger something that's already in the brain? Or is it a combination? I mean, something's got to happen. Like, I got, I got an email the other day saying, somebody said, well, I believe the Holy Spirit does this and Jesus does that. And I said, fine, that's fine, but I want to know how. 
Something's going to happen. There has to be... Receptors in the brain have to be stimulated in some way. Photons in the brain, synapses in the brain, things have to fire. Tell me how. Don't just tell me it happens. I want to know how. And, you, and, and to say, well, you can't know how is wrong because that's the key. That's what the Gnostic said many thousands of years ago in Egypt. You're not saved by faith. You're saved by knowledge. You're saved by understanding. You're not to be a nuclear scientist. I'm not in a class of category of Dr. Narby to, or NASA. But those people are doing the job. Those people are the, are the priests and the ministers and the rabbis today that we should be listening to. Not people who dwell in 14th century superstitions. So is it outside? Is it inside? Dr. Narby reaches a reasonably similar conclusion and the conclusions are exactly what goes on in this room. So we're in very good company with this laureate from Stanford University. And this is what he said. Maybe I'll find the answer by looking at both perspectives at the same time. One eye on science and the other on the shaman. That's right. One eye on science and the other on the Bible. Or we could say that. So this is Narby. Then he said the solution would therefore consist in, in, in posting the posing the, the question differently. It's not a matter of asking whether the source of the hallucination is internal or external, but considering that it might be both at the same time. And, and then he says, I could see how this could work, although maybe I can't, but I do like the idea because the two uh, points of view which are divergent, I can bring them back together. So he continued his research. And he studied the experience of anthropologist Michael Harner, who went to the Amazon, to try to understand the religious systems of the, of the people out there. And he was sitting around the fire in the same jungle and he said, I want to just understand your religious beliefs. And the guy says, the only way you're going to understand our religious beliefs is to take a drink of Ayasuka. So he did. <laughs> and he saw the same serpents. They told him if he really wanted to learn. And he did and off he went. So, he saw giant reptiles, creatures projecting scenes in front of his eyes, and he was shown the earth as it was eons ago, and then he saw black things coming down to the earth, large, shiny, black creatures. And they explained that they had come to earth to escape their enemies. They created life on earth so that they could hide in the multitude of forms, and Dr. Harner then said, you know, I realize the myth inherent in that hallucination that I learned that the dragon-like creatures with us inside all forms of life, including us. And he wrote in his footnotes this very important statement. In retrospect, one could say that these were almost like DNA. Although, in 1961, I knew nothing of DNA. Now, consider this. NASA has just this month released their Green Party paper connecting life from above and the green in humans and plants with DNA. I mean, if, if you look on page 114C, you'll see the DNA. The molecular code reads like an encrypted message. An encrypted message from who the messenger? And who's the messenger? Photon. This even sounds like Star Wars. The door opens and who comes in? Photon. I like that. It's terrific. Jeez. Well, Narby didn't find anything further about DNA. But he was intrigued by references everywhere he was looking to the dragon and the serpent. And when he thought of the dragon and the serpent and, you know, and the intertwining thing like you see in your doctor's lapel, Dr. Norby said, it made me think of the double helix of DNA, two entwined serpents. Two entwined serpents. And, and as it says in the Bible, in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 8, sometimes you should look at it. It talks about the construction of the temple. And it says, and the door to the middle chamber. Now, the middle chamber is reference to the center of the brain, the third ventricle. But anyhow, the door to the middle chamber was in the right side, 
And they went up with winding stairs. It's in the Bible, 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 8, the winding stairs. And so Dr. Narby then found a book called The Brain and Mind in Shamanism by Geraldo Reichel Domeltoff. And he was looked and he was stopped by a drawing of the human brain with a snake lodged between the two hemispheres. He found a, a second picture of two entwined snakes like the caduceus. And in this, in shamanism, the two entwined snakes uh, symbolize a female and a male, a mother and a father, a water and land, yin and yang. They, they represent the opposition, spiraling rhythmically, pulsating. Now, this is the interesting part. Narby considered the hallucination of anthropologist Harner in the Amazon and then the mythical concepts of the people in Colombia who live thousands of miles away, jungle people, both cases are of reptiles and serpents in the brain and cosmic shaped serpent boats of cosmic origin that were vessels of life at the beginning of the time. And he says, how could this be a pure coincidence? I mean, how, could, how is it possible that both of these people could know this when they couldn't communicate with one another? Yet it's the same exact thing. It's like the hundred monkey theory. The vision was exactly the same. So the plot starts to thicken here. DNA, green light, angles of light as messenger particles, angelic messengers, if you will. And so then he studied a French book called Vision, Knowledge and Power by Jean-Pierre Jomille. And Dr. Narby says, I found a celestial serpent in a drawing of a universe. Then another shaman was quoted as saying, at the very beginning, before the birth of the earth, this earth here, our most distant ancestors lived on another earth. And he adds that the Yogya people consider that all living beings, listen to me now real carefully, this is from jungle people, all living beings were created by twins. Let me repeat it. All living beings were created by twins. And the central characters in all the thoughts of the forest and jungle people of creation are the twins. Remember Mani? Mani who told us that the snake who tempted Eve was actually the good person? When Mani went and he tried to tell this to people, they say, who told you this? He said, I met an angel. They said, what was the angel's name? He said the angel's name was the twin. Yes. Can I show you something? Sure. Up here, it's Alviro. The, uh, yeah, this is a planet locator that I got from the, uh, Eric Zimmerman. He runs the uh, Ocean County Planetarium. And uh, what are you talking about, about the twins? First of all, they're in the year 2002. In this planet locator, Saturn, Satan, the serpent, in the year 2000 is in Taurus from 2000, 2001, 2002 it goes into Orion for three months, back into Taurus, and then it goes into Gemini, the twins. Right. Carries through until somewhere past the year 2004. Uranus, Uranus is in Capricorn for two years, and then all of a sudden in the year 2002 it goes into Aquarius in the fourth month. Stays in Aquarius for four months, goes back into goes back into uh, Cap Capricorn, and then it goes into Aquarius in the second month of the year 2003 and stays there until. And then both of them are in Gemini and Aquarius for a long period of for time, period for the time. twins. And interestingly, too, in 2002 is the projection is when the supernova light's supposed to hit the Earth. Yeah, that's what. Very good. Very good. Um, but anyhow, I wanted to, once again, the people of the jungle who know about these plants say that all beings were created by twins. So Narby then was really fascinating and he started to analyze this concept and he said, wait a minute, a Western anthropologist like Horner drinks a, small, a strong dose of this ayasuka and gains access in the middle of the 20th century to a world that informs the mythological concepts of other people 
and allows them to communicate with life-creating spirits of cosmic origin linked to DNA. And you and I, studying this NASA report, realize all of this is connected to green light because NASA tells us in this documentation that we have that when this light touches the green in plants and in us, it triggers the amino acids and DNA, the most powerful booster of the universe. And then again, too, that the light, and I was just talking about 2002, NASA has told us that the light from the center eye of supernova 1987 will touch the Earth around 2000, 2002. And remember, that center eye is green. And remember, this is all being pushed by the tremendous power of Uranus, and Uranus is the green planet. And may the force be with you. <laughs> oh, God. So, between this, we're arriving at not just a connection between light and the protein in green, that is such power, but you're also arriving at a knowledge of the DNA connection, a combination of external DNA outside, communicating with internal DNA, and the coded message being sent now is received and decoded in new states of consciousness. So indeed, a plant can talk to you. Not as a plant, hello, no, that's not going to work, but the DNA from the plant will communicate with the DNA in you because they're the same. So Nardi was still trying to figure out the logical path of possibilities concerning plants and people, and he went back to this Shomiel's text about twins. And Chelmiel said that the Yogya people considered all living beings were created by twins. So Narby wrote something. He said on a piece of paper, he's very late at night, he was, I was getting tired. He said, but, you know, with my knowledge and my background, my scientific knowledge, I just wrote this. Twins equal... Yeah. Indeed, all things are created by twins. So he says, these indirect connections between DNA and hallucinatory and mythological spheres seemed amusing to me at first, but most intriguing. So now Darby has reached a similar point to our work. One eye on mythology, one eye on the uh, science, and what Darby arrived at is what religion has never found, and where they have made the most severe mistake. The ancients are not going to use the words science or DNA. They use symbols that mean science and DNA. And Narby writes, as I browsed over the writings on mythology, I discovered with surprise that the theme of twin creator beings of celestial origin was common in South America and indeed throughout the whole world. There was the story of Averi and his sister who can, c c created life by transformation. So now we see where he's going. The twins, the serpents, the double helix, the winding stairs, DNA. It is interesting because now Narby discovered something else in the world of the Aztecs. The plumed serpent god Quetzalcoatl. Have you ever heard of Quetzalcoatl? symbolizes the sacred energy of life and his twin brother, Tazupoka, both of whom are children of the cosmic serpent, Kultaku. Now, Dr. Nerby speaks, when I read the following passage from Claude Lévi-Strauss' book, I jumped. In Aztec, the word Kotal of Quetzalcoatl means both serpent and twin. The name Quetzalcoatl is interpreted as the plumed serpent or magnificent twin. So Narby comes to where we have been for a long time, and I will say this with all honesty. He says, I had looked up DNA in several encyclopedias, 
and had noted that the shape of the double helix was most often described as a ladder, a twisted rope, a coiling serpent, or a spiral staircase. And if I look in the Bible again, it says in 1 Kings 6, 8, the door for the middle chamber of the temple was in the right side of the house, and they went up with winding stairs into the middle and out of the middle into the third, which is the third ventricle. The middle chamber... Could you bear with me for a few minutes more? I wanted to... Sh didn't sound like a big, exciting response, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> I... Let me just uh, show you where he is talking about how the ancients would represent these things. And the Bible says that in, in the temple, they went up with winding stairs. There's your DNA. There's the double helix. There's the serpents. There's the caduceus. There's the kundalini. There's the twisted ladder. There's the winding stair. That is what he found. He just found it. I hate to tell him, but if you've been coming here, you know we, we found it a long time ago. I certainly don't put myself in the category of, of him. But nonetheless, what he then reached the point of trying to say, how come nobody ever realized this? How come nobody, in reading the, the books about uh, this stuff from, from these people, never realized, realized this? The winding stairs referred to here, going up to the third ventral. So as we look here at, at this, we can see this is the spiral stairs. And how did he find this out? This is something that he didn't know as a scientist because he was a scientist. And the people of the church don't know it because they're religious. But Dr. Norby had a friend of his, and he said, whenever you look at mythology, look to the form. Look to the form. In other words, when you see winding stairs or coiled serpents, what you are looking at is all symbolism. It represents something. This is what religion has been teaching you for years about the ark and about the garden, and about the serpents, and about all of the crucifixion, and all of this stuff. They're looking literally instead of saying, what do these things represent? What is a true story here? As a true story was written by people from another place, another planet, another dimension, telling you in symbolic form, just look at the form and start to understand, and we'll unveil for you the mystery of the universe and put you in a position of knowing what's coming down and when it's coming. So I listened to Dr. Narby, and this is what he said. I had looked at DNA, the shape of the double helix described as a ladder or a spiral staircase, and it was during the following split second asking myself whether there were any ladders in shamanism with a revelation occurred. The ladders, the ladders, the ladders, symbols of all of these mystics around the world. I found countless examples of ladders and spiral staircases and braided ropes in Australia, Tibet, Nepal, Egypt, all over the place. The symbol of that ladder implies communication between the sky and the earth. It is a means that the gods descend to earth and go up into the sky. Can you think of another ladder in the Bible that talks in the same way? Jacob's ladder. Jacob's ladder is DNA. And the angels go up and down. And the messengers go up and down. And the messengers go up and down. And they communicate. And when, and, and when you bring that from the outside through your meditation, up and down on the ladder it goes within you and it brings you a new message of understanding. So there in the Bible is the very same thing that Mar Narby was finding in ancient myths all over the world, the spiral staircase. And Dr. Narby says, I started to view all of this in a new light. I started to look at other writings and discovered cosmic serpents. Here is a scientist from Stanford University who spent his whole life in science and understanding and anthropology, and suddenly the whole world opened up because he started to realize, I have to have one eye on the ancient writings and one eye on science. 
And he said, I started to look at cosmic serpents, and this time it was the Australian Aborigines. And do you know what the Australian Aborigines believed? Get this. Are you ready for this? I want you to look at this. <laughs> they said, creation was the work of the rainbow snake, whose powers were symbolized by the quartz crystal. Who said that? The Australian Aborigines. They don't wear pants either. <laughs> but what did they know about the quartz crystal? They knew azosia, light filtered by crystal, which is part of the cosmic code that we receive, that the ancients received. The power of crystal, the power of green plants, light filtered by crystal, coming to the earth at an angle, coming to the earth, entering in at the pineal gland of the brain as you collapse the wave, and then the DNA triggering through the hema, touching the green, triggering a DNA inside of you that communicates a new message to your DNA. Your DNA starts talking to the DNA which is God. Now the question in Narby is, how could it be that Australian Aborigines, separated from the rest of humanity for 40,000 years, tell the same story about the creation of life by the cosmic serpent associated with quartz crystals as told by these people in the middle of the jungle who are drinking Akahuyuzu, Ayukuzu. How could this possibly be? And now then listen to what his conclusion is. This is my conclusion, Dr. Narby says. Western culture, that's us, that's religion, that's the smarty pants up on the street. Western culture has cut itself off from the serpent life principle. In other words, DNA, since it adopted an exclusively rational point of view. You cut yourself off from it. Number two, the people who practice what we call shamanism, or whatever you want to call it, are actually communicating with DNA. This is a laureate from Stanford University saying this, an anthropologist, a scientist. Number three, the part of humanity that cut itself off us managed to discover the material existence of the same thing in a laboratory 3,000 years later. In other words, what these people knew 3,000 years ago, we said was all devil and all of this stuff, we discovered in a laboratory 3,000 years later exactly what they were talking about. In other words, this was in the Bible 4,000 years ago. We found it in a laboratory a few years ago. Now here is an absolutely amazing statement by Dr. Jeremy Narby of Stanford University in California. People use different techniques to gain access to knowledge of the vital principle. In their visions, shamans manage to take their consciousness to the molecular level. This is how they learn to combine brain hormones with monomine oxidase inhibitors, or how they discovered 40 different sources of muscle paralyzers, whereas science has only been able to imitate their molecules. Now the conclusion of this anthropologist from Stanford University is this. When they say their knowledge comes from beings they see in their hallucinations, their words mean exactly what they say. And let me show you something else that Narby explains. Many people have found it difficult to meditate here because we use music. And you know, I understand. And I just want you to consider this. And I want you to think about this. Because we just don't know everything. I've explained this before, but the reason that we do it here is because it was the direction of the Buddha. And it was the direction of Pythagoras. Dr. Narby states, according to the shamans of the entire world, one establishes communication with spirit via music. For these people who come face to face with the higher, it is inconceivable to enter the world of spirit and remain silent. He goes on, 
Angelika gerbert Sayer discusses the visual music projected by the spirit in front of the shaman's eyes. It is made of three-dimensional images that coalesce into sound and that the shaman imitates by emitting corresponding melodies. Dr. Narby said, my next project is to check whether DNA sends out music. So you see, music may not be the way that people in this country approach meditation, but it is the way for those who have made contact. And the reason is, as Pythagoras told us, the sounds touch the nerves, the chakras, and open the gates that we can't open otherwise. So the wonder that came to Narby's mind was no one had noticed the possible links between the myths of the primitive people and molecular biology. No one had seen that the double helix had symbolized the life principle for thousands of years around the world. I am filled with the same surprise myself when I see it in religion, and I see these people on television in religion, taking what is obviously mythology literally, it astounds me that educated and sophisticated people cannot see what the ancients were talking about. And they can't. So now Arby, Narby was so overwhelmed with excitement, he had to tell somebody. So he made a phone call. You know, it's like us. You know, you're going to think I'm nuts, but when you hear this, and he talked about DNA and the serpents and the twisted stairs and so forth. And he was telling his friend, and he says, after he told him about the, the, the ladders and the spiral staircases, and he added, there was a last correlation that is slightly less clear than the others. He said, the spirits they see in these hallucinations are three-dimensional, and they emit sounds, and they speak a language made of three-dimensional sounds. In other words, they're made of their own language, like DNA. And Narby said there was a long silence on the other end of the line, and he waited in the silence, and then his friend spoke, and he says, you know, you're right, and like DNA, they replicate themselves to relay their information. And he wrote this down, comparing the hallucinations and DNA, and he remembered the first Gospel of John, that says, in the beginning was the word and the language, and this was his conclusion. In their visions, shamans take their consciousness to the molecular level and gain access to information related to DNA. This is where they see double helixes, twisted ladders, chromosome shapes. This is how they've known for millennia that the vital principle is the same for all living beings and is shaped like entwined serpents, a ladder, a staircase. DNA is the source of their astonishing botanical and medical knowledge. The myths are filled with biological immunity, and what the shamans explains corresponds precisely to the descriptions that biologists are starting to provide of DNA. Now, I want you to listen carefully, and I, and I, I appreciate you being patient with me because I, this is the end of this particular study that we're doing, and I just wanted to finish it. I want you to listen to to Narby, for in meditation the photons come down and enter us via the pineal gland. That's the way this all works, and this is what I've told you about sending out light, you're sending out photons. He goes on, I needed to understand how DNA could transmit visual information. How could that be? I knew that it emitted photons, which are electromagnetic waves. And I remember what Carlos Perez Schumann told me when he compared the spirits to radio waves. You turn your radio, you can pick them up. It's, it's like that with souls and Ayasuka. You can see them and hear them. So then Narby looked into the literature of photons of biological origin. You know what he said? I want you, don't miss that. He was studying photons of biological origin. In other words, photons inside of you. And they are called biophotons. The light inside of you. That's why Jesus said you are the light. You are the family of light. That's why when I told you of how the light leaves the body when the body dies, it's the biophoton. It is light of biological origin. Now here's the proof of what I told you about sending light to others. Here's the indisputable proof. Dr. Narby says, in the early 1980s, a team of scientists demonstrated that the cells of all living beings emit photons at a rate of approximately 100 units per second and square centimeter of surplus area. They also showed that DNA was the source of this photon emission. The photon coming in is DNA. The photon going out is DNA. It is God. 
the serpent kundalini, the spiral staircase, DNA emitting photons, which are angles of light, messenger particles, emitted, sent out by you and me, received by you and me, and Dr. Norby has given us proof that this is true. I learned with astonishment about this, he said, yet this didn't prove that the light emitted by DNA was what shaman saw in the vision, but there was a fundamental aspect of this photon emission I couldn't grasp. According to the researchers, its weakness is, corresponds to uh, the intensity of a candle, but it has surprisingly high degree of coherence. That's the light coming out of you. You didn't even know there was a light coming out of you. But now you can, only, you can pick up all the Bible and read about the light inside of you, and you are the light and the father of light, and God is light, and now you know it's true. So the question he had to contend with is, how could a, an ultra-weak signal be highly coherent? How could a distant candle be compared to a laser? In other words, DNA emits photons with such regularity that researchers compare the phenomenon to an ultra-weak laser. Coming out of you is a laser photon. And the details of these hallucinations found that the people experienced bright color. And those who studied the chemical in the plants that the subjects described the colors as brighter and more intense. It was the blue sky of a desert, but on another planet. And Narby says, this is almost too good to be true. DNA's highly coherent photon emission accounted for the luminescence of hallucinatory images as well as their three-dimensional aspect. Now I know. So now Narby had reached a solution, and this is the end of it. Green plants, green light, DNA from the outside entering within and causing knowledge to exist where it did not exist before. Everything you've ever dreamed of, everything that you've ever come in here to sit down in this dark room and meditate and bring the light inside of you, he's proven to it. We have documentation from this laureate from Stanford University. Let me say it again. DNA, DNA from the outside entering within and causing knowledge to exist where it did not exist before. The molecules of nicotine and some other big word contained in Ayasuka activate the respective receptors, which set off a cascade of electrochemical reactions inside the neurons, leading to the stimulation of DNA, and more particularly to its emission of visible waves, which shamans perceived as hallucination. They perceive it physically as a hallucination. It wasn't really a hallucination. While the transmission from the outside DNA was being made to the inside DNA, there was this perception of a hallucination. There is the source of knowledge. DNA emitting photons, get this one from Dr. Narby, DNA emitting photons like an aquatic dragon spitting fire. So my conclusion then with you folks is to meditate and study on these revelations. Something new today, DNA contains photons. The light from above touches us on the earth, animals and humans, and stimulates DNA. Therefore, we understand an amazing thing that even though we were touching on this before, it was not clear. In your meditation, you draw through the pineal the light or magnetism which enters your body and touches the hema or hemoglobin of the green, which in turn sends forth photons, angels of light, angles of light, coming to us in this way, carried to their destination on the wings of song and the wings of music. Photons flying through us in meditative music and providing us with new logics, understanding the power to heal. DNA, music, light, green, center. Play your music as you sit. Play your music as you wait for the light of supernova 1987A. And now our new friend, Eta Karina. And now the hypernova and soar with eagle's wings into the bosom of all creation and the new part of the universe which is coming down upon us all. Join the Green Party. And may the force be with you. Thank you. See